chapter 4. If you're new to the Bible, that's about three-fourths of the way through it. Or you can check the table of contents. God gives you that to help you as well. Galatians chapter 4. time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. This is God's word for us this morning. Let me pray. Father God, you are majestic and awesome. You are our creator. God, you are our sustainer. The very breath in our lungs right now. Lord, is a gift from you. You sustain our lives even in this moment. We praise you for that. We thank you for that. And God, I pray that this morning as we look at your word, God, that you would, uh, that your people would be fed and that you would be glorified. And we ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you this morning. And I want you to think along these lines as we get started here today. What makes someone great? What makes someone truly great? Not just ordinary, not just normal, but what makes someone truly great? And if we think of the world's standards, it's maybe um, achieving great wealth, uh, achieving fame for reasons for whatever, power, influence, right? These are the things that, man, when, when someone has become truly great, that they They've got a hold of those types of things. But I want to submit to you, what if there's a different test of greatness? What if, what if there's a different way to assess when someone is truly great? Uh, when I was in fourth grade, uh, we had a music teacher. Her name was Mrs. Outley. And she would come up with these songs that applied to math and other subjects. And at the time... I thought it was lame. I was like, what are we doing singing about all this? But you know what? Now, I'm 42 years old. I see that she had a greatness to her. A hidden greatness to her. You know why? Watch this. Multiplying fractions ain't no problem. It's the top times the top and the bottom times the bottom. <laughs> What's up? I know how to handle multiply fractions. Do you? You do now because you know the song. And she would come up with all these little things. Right? And you know what? I wish my 8th grade teacher had done that. You know? Like, my algebra teacher, they didn't do songs. It was just, hey, all of a sudden we're throwing alphabet in the math now. You figure that out, Josh. It's like, what? X and Y and what? I mean, I, I needed some more songs, right? 30 years later, her songs have stuck with me. <laughs> what I thought was goofy was actually greatness in disguise. C.S. Lewis has many quotes. He's a famous author, but I think this is one of his most underrated. I really like this. He says this, Everywhere the great enters the little, its power to do so is almost the test of its greatness. Think about that. Everywhere the great enters the little, its power to do so is almost the test of its greatness. And that's what Miss Outley did. She, being a teacher, had more knowledge than us. She, had, she was greater in our, in, in our world, but she entered the smallness of our little fourth grade minds through the power of song, she entered, the, the, her greatness entered our little with cleverness and effectiveness. She passed the hidden test of greatness. You know, that's what great parents do. When you get down on the floor and wrestle with your kids, 
or when your grandkids or whoever, like when you get down on their level, that's what it is. That, that everywhere, the great enters the little, its power to do so is almost the test of its greatness. I've titled the message today, Passing the Test of Christmas Greatness. Because that's what Paul lays out for us here in Galatians 4. God shows us what true greatness is in sending Jesus down to us. And man, that's what we celebrate during this time. So, I think three ways I want to give you today from Scripture that you can have a deeper joy in the Lord during this Christmas. Three ways. Number one, you can rejoice in his schedule. You can rejoice in his son. And you can rejoice in his salvation. All right, let's get right into that. But first, rejoice in his schedule. Go back with me. The start of verse 4. Look at what he says. Look what scripture says. It says, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. In other words, at the proper time. At the right time. At the exact perfect time. We would say it like this. God's schedule is absolutely, positively, 100% precisely correct. And guess what? Man, in our, in our limited wisdom, in our limited way of viewing the world, we don't always see it, do we? We don't always understand it. And you know what? We may not fully understand it this side of eternity. While we're still down here, we may not fully understand his timing. But I'll tell you this, God's schedule is always the right one. And when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. You know what will help you learn about precise scheduling? The broil setting on your oven. <laughs> <laughs> When you use your oven on the bake setting, as I understand it, you use both the top element and the bottom element. But when you turn that thing on broil, I know they look similar. They both start with B. Okay? But when you use the broil setting, it's just the top element. And friends, it gets hot real quick, real fast. And you better keep a sharp eye on whatever you're broiling, right? Because it goes quick, right? This will teach you about proper timing. And here's the thing. I want to give you a gift today. Uh, this is free. I want to share with you a Christmas tree. You can make this year round, but I'm just calling it a Christmas tree because we're almost there. So you can go home today and do this. All right. So some steps here. Okay. Number one, turn on the broil. Oh, hold on. Back, hold, back up, back up. Uh, get back that on one slide there. Uh, there we go. Step one, turn on the broil setting. Okay. Now, while that's happening, I want you to lightly toast some bread. Your choice. I like wheat, but whatever. You do you. Okay? Following with me? Alright, step three. Here we go. A thin layer, or a little bit thin plus, a layer of crunchy peanut butter. Okay? That's essential. Alright, and then step four. Here we go. I want you to arrange a layer of marshmallows. You can put it on some foil, something like that. Arrange some marshmallows on top. Step five. Here we go. You're going to pop that thing in the oven, okay? And you better have eyes on target, okay? <laughs> Boom. Lock in right here in that moment because it's going to go quick. It's going to go real quick. When that thing's on broil, I'm just telling you, son, it's, it's, you better lock in. Okay, so that's step five. Pop it in the oven. Step six, eyes on target. Here we go. This is crucial. Step seven, when that comes out, you just want to lightly sprinkle a little bit of cinnamon right on top of that. Perfectly crisp, lightly golden marshmallows. And then here's number eight. This is optional. You can also even throw on a couple <laughs> cocoa nibs if you want. And I'm telling you, son, that's some good eating. <laughs> that is some good eating. I'm telling you, if, on a day like this where it's kind of cool in the morning, oh, boy, come on now. <laughs> here's the thing. If you pull it out too early... You're not going to get that golden brown on those marshmallows, right? If you're too early, it's not going to be that, that beautiful golden crisp on that marshmallow. If you start texting and take your eyes off it <laughs> while it's under broil, guess what's going to happen? You're going to singe that thing. 
it is going to burn and it's going to burn quick. But if your timing is precise, man, you're in for a Christmas tree. My encouragement to you is this. God never takes his eyes off of you and me. He sees you. He knows what you're going through. And guess what? God knows when you're facing the heat of adversity or whatever it is that you're walking through, whatever struggle. You may be facing hard things in this December, but I promise you, know this, God is watching and his timing is right. One of my favorite pastors, H.P. Charles, says this. He says, whenever God shows up, it's the right time. He showed up for Noah before the rain and flood, but it was still the right time. He showed up for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego while they were in the fiery furnace, but it was still the right time. He didn't show up for Mary and Martha until Lazarus had been dead for four days, but it was still the right time. Whenever God shows up, it's the right time. We can trust. We can rejoice in his schedule. Jesus showed up at the right time. We can rejoice in that. We can be thankful for that. This Christmas, I invite you, as hard as it may be, to let go of your schedule, of the way you think things should roll out and go, your timeline, and trust in his divine timing. Some questions to consider here. Am I trusting in his schedule, or am I trying to force and control what I can? And secondly, how can I rest more in God's perfect timing? So first, we rejoice in his schedule. Next, we rejoice in his son. Back to verse 4 once more. Look at it. It says this, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. God's greatness is shown to also, not just in his schedule, but in the gift he gives us. God doesn't stay far away. God's not distant. He comes near to us. He sends us his son. One commentator, J.I. Packer, he says it like this. He says, it is here in the thing that happened at the first Christmas that the most profound, unfathomable depths of the Christian revelation lie. God became man. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as this truth to the incarnation. Think, uh, think about Maybe some painful Christmas memories of the past. I have some. I don't know if you do. Um, when I was young, my parents would make us kids put on a Christmas pageant every year. For like no one. It, it wasn't like a neighborhood. There wasn't like people coming to watch this. This wasn't like the Taylor Swift heiress tour like where people are... You know, it was just a Christmas pageant in our house. We would reenact a Christmas story. I have an older brother. He got to play the role of Joseph. Okay? I have a younger sister. She was just a baby at the time. So naturally, she's going to be the baby. You know what that left me playing? <laughs> Two roles. One, the donkey. Two, Mary. I didn't like it. And look, man, I take pride in my reign as an actor. No, I have no, I have no ability. But I'm like, man, I gotta, I gotta haul my older brother around on my back, and then costume change into Barry. Like, what is up, man? You mean to tell me that's what my Christmas is gonna be? Those are the roles I have to play. Here's the truth. Jesus came as the Son of God, in the role of a servant. And he embraced it. This is true Christmas greatness. Jesus lays out almost like his mission statement in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He says this, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Son came to serve. He embraced the role of a servant. Aren't you thankful for Jesus? The son who became a servant. 
He entered our smallness. And he said, I'm here to serve you. <laughs> That's amazing. Here's, I think, four ways this can bring an encouragement to you during this Christmas season. There's many ways. We, I, I'll just give you four here. Number one, by serving these people through preaching the word, Jesus shows us the Bible is to be trusted, studied, and received completely. So, man, you can receive the word this Christmas. Number two, by serving the hurting with touch, compassion, and miracles, Jesus shows us the Father's heart for suffering people. Jesus shows us what God thinks about those who are hurting. He cares. He cares. Number three, by serving his disciples through washing their feet, Jesus shows us that leadership is putting others' needs ahead of your own. Man, and we can step into that joyfully, not begrudgingly, joyfully, just as Christ did. And number four, by serving the outcasts with dignity, intimacy, and love, Jesus shows us that no one is beyond the grace of God. Amen. Zacchaeus, the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, over and over, Jesus says, no, they matter. And there's grace that is sufficient for them too. Amen. That's true greatness right there. That's greatness. I was upset because I had to play a couple roles that were beneath me once a year. <laughs> Jesus willingly took on the lowest role possible for 33 years to serve. I rejoice in that this Christmas. Some questions to consider here. What does it mean to me personally that the Son of Man came as a servant? How can the incarnation comfort me tonight or during this Christmas season? And secondly, and where do I have opportunities to serve others like Jesus? Is it teaching the word? Is it helping the hurting? Is it washing feet somehow? Is it connecting with the rejected? And I believe God put us on earth for a specific purpose. And if you're alive and breathing, which you are right now, man, guess what? God's not finished with you. And there is purpose and things that he has for you to step into you. And you can do that this Christmas season. So you rejoice in his schedule. You rejoice in his son. Finally, rejoice in his salvation. Let's look at it all as one unit here. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. One pastor named Wendell Berry, he says it like this. He says, I take literally the statement in the Gospel of John that God loves the world. He says, I believe that the world was created and approved by love and that it subsists, coheres, and endures by love. And that insofar as it is, as it is redeemable, it can be redeemed only by love. I believe that divine love incarnate and indwelling in the world summons the world always toward wholeness, which ultimately is reconciliation and atonement with God. This is why Jesus came. <clears throat> to make the way of salvation. Man, we are sinful people who rebel against God. We are the ones who desperately need the grace, that reconciliation, that atonement with God. And here's the truth. It won't be your actions. It won't be that you're here today on Sunday morning. It won't be because you live a good life. It won't be because you could pass a Jesus pop quiz if I gave one. It won't be because you wear a Christian t-shirt or you show up on Sunday, Sunday night, and even Wednesday night. It won't be any of those things. Your only hope for salvation is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we can say it this way. Jesus comes as the sinless son who will be treated as sinful outcast, so that sinful outcasts, you and me, might become saved sons of God. This is the redemption and adoption of the gospel. In our world, if you go to like a bookstore, you probably have seen these in the last 15, 20 years. There's a whole line of books called The Complete Idiot's Guide. 
to a whole host, right? Like this is the complete idiot's guide to small business for Canadians. Like, thank you, finally, somebody wrote the definitive work on that, right? But in these books, what they do, the whole idea of these book series is you take a subject and you break it down so simply, so easy to do its most basic levels so that about just about anybody could understand it, right? The complete idiot's guide. They don't write like a self-important college professor and they want to make it simple. <laughs> Let, I'll show you some of the subjects that they cover. This is amazing. Uh, the complete idiot's guide to sailing, to gluten-free cooking, Eastern philosophy, motorcycles, connecting with your angels, okay, whatever, um, ventriloquism, finishing your basement, handwriting analysis, and thank the Lord, beanie babies. Yes, we need a complete idiot's guide. And my favorite is this one here, the complete idiot's guide to street magic. And it says, on the, the, the quote up there, it says, mind-blowing tricks and all inspiring illusions anyone can learn. I guess if you don't, you just go to magic camp with Michael Scott. I don't know. Um, and that, that's the promise, though. That's the promise of these books. Like, the, hey, we're taking a subject, and we're making it so easy that, man, if you feel like a complete idiot, then guess what? You can get in on this. You can learn this. I want to tell you, Christmas is like this. God sending Jesus here is the best version of this. We would call it the complete sinner's guide to salvation, right? And it wouldn't be mind-blowing street stuff. It would be mind-blowing holiness and awe-inspiring sacrifice anyone can receive. We're all sinners who rebelled against God. We've run from it. We all need salvation. And God doesn't leave us in the dark about that. Man, he comes down here. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We could say it this way. Jesus comes not to give us a list of how-tos, but with his, it is finished. Salvation is found in putting all of your trust in Christ and his completed work. Hear me. Every other, every other religion you can find on this earth is going to tell you how you can reach up and how, how to do this, how to do that, and how you can reach up and try to find acceptance with God. Christianity says, no, 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 no. This is how God reaches down to you. He sends his only begotten son so that you can be redeemed, so that you can be adopted as a child of God. Jesus came to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption as sons. That's about the best Christmas gift you can ever receive. You're here. And if you've received it, guess what? You can rejoice in that. Amen. Some questions to consider here. Have I put my full trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ? Or am, am I living for him today? And secondly, how can I tell others of the redemptive love of God made known by his son? We've looked at three ways from these two verses that you can have a deeper joy in Christmas this year. We said you can rejoice in his schedule. His timing is right. You can rejoice in his son. He doesn't stay far away. You can rejoice in his salvation, his adoption. And we've reflected today on this idea that C.S. Lewis said it this way. Everywhere the great enters the little, its power to do so is almost the test of its greatness. But let me ask you a question. What did that look like? What did that sound like? What was it truly like for the God of the entire universe to embrace the smallness of humanity with us? To close, I'll give you a content recommendation. Maybe you're tired of hearing the same Christmas songs over and over, and you're quite frankly ready to never hear Mariah Carey ever again. <laughs> I hear you, brother, sister. Okay, amen, amen, right? Well, I'll give you a content recommendation to close. This is a Christmas song. It's called Come and Stand Amazed by the artist Citizens off of their album, Repeat the Sounding Joy. You could add this to your Christmas playlist. Uh, I feel it's one of the more better written Christmas
Christmas songs. They took an old, old, old Dutch hymn and they uh, kind of modernized it. And today we're going to close with just some lyrics. I won't dare try to sing it, but I'll just give you some lyrics uh, to think about and meditate on. It says this, Come and stand amazed, you people. See how God has reconciled. See his plans of love accomplished. See his gift, this newborn child. See the mighty, weak, and tender. See the word who now is mute. See the sovereign without splendor. See the fullness destitute. O Lord Jesus, God incarnate, who assumed this humble form, counsel me and let my wishes to your perfect will conform. Light of life, dispel my darkness. Let your frailty strengthen me. Let your meekness give me boldness. Let your burden set me free. O Emmanuel, my Savior, let your death be life for me. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you.